Okay, so this month we're going to look at a library for writing native Win32 applications. So that's a GUI application for Windows. It's called Win32, but really will be, you know, it's a 64-bit. You know, you're, you're programming to a 64-bit operating system at this point. I mean, I guess you can still get a 32-bit version of Windows that's supported, maybe. I don't know. I think they're all 64-bit now, but... It's just called historically Win32 because the original DOS Windows was Win16. It was a 16-bit API, and then when that uh, was brought over to 32-bit native applications, they called it Win32, and it's just kind of it is the name now. So it's called Win32, but it's really it's all 64-bit code that we'll be looking at. So um, this library, WinLAM. Um, Kind of a little bit of history, you know, WinLAM is a, is a recent header-only open source. It's got an MIT license, which means you are free to modify it. It's not GPL, so you can take it, modify it, keep those modifications private. There's no requirement that you contribute back if you modify it in any way. So it's a very um, permissive license. Um, but the Win32 API has been around for a long, long time, and... GUI applications, graphical user interface applications, lend themselves naturally to object-oriented programming. And if you look at the Win32 API, you see that really everything is objects, and the objects are represented by handles. And instead of calling methods on the on objects directly, like you would in a C++ object-oriented program where you've got classes and you've got methods on classes, you call functions, and the first argument to the function is always the handle that does the operation on the object. So you have a handle to the object. You pass it as the first argument to this function that does some operation on the object. And then the other arguments to the function and the return value are used to communicate in and out of the object. So really, it's, it is all objects. But when Windows was first created, the primary programming language that everybody was using was C, and C doesn't have objects. So you, what you do is you create C function calls, and they really operate on objects, and the, op the insides of the objects are all hidden through these handles. The handles are just opaque pointers to some piece of memory that holds all the internal data that's representing the object. And you'll, so you'll call a C function, to create one of these objects, it gives you a handle back, and then you do operations on the object by calling other functions that take the handle as an argument, and then to free the oper to, to, to free the object, you will call some kind of destroy function with the handle, and then that releases the associated internal storage associated with the handle. So that's the way the Windows API looks. It's everything's handles, and it's it. it it is conceptually objects, but the way it's all implemented is through these opaque pointers that are the handle types. So as uh, Windows evolved and C++ came around, they created uh, the Microsoft Foundation Classes Library. Um, and uh, that was what we looked at that. That was 31 years ago that they created that. And that is a set of classes that expose all those GUI objects as true C++ objects. So instead of doing some weird function call and a bunch of you know weird data pointers being passed around in order to say get the text out of an edit box, you have an edit box class in MFC and you just call get text to get the text out of it. So it looks more like a C++ object. Now the MFC class design is such that, um, you know, kind of, if you use MFC for an application, it's kind of in for a penny, in for a pound. So as soon as you do your first line of MFC, it's like eight megabytes of code gets linked into your application, and that's it. You know, you, you don't have any choice. You can't get just the 260 kilobytes or whatever of MFC that you're actually using because it's all connected together. So it's it's a big thing, and it comes in. And so you pay a heavy cost for that first bit of MFC, but as you add more and more window types and more and more dialogues and more and more GUI to your application, 
it doesn't get significantly larger because the 8 megabytes is the entire implementation of this whole framework for GUI applications. So that's fine if you're just doing a desktop style application, but if you're trying to make a little GUI plugin component to somebody else's application, paying 8 megabytes for every one of those components is prohibitive. So they, um, for these components that can bind into other objects, they came up with something called the component object model. This is a whole um, framework for being able to write a piece of functionality in any programming language and have it be binary compatible with components written in any other programming language. And really, if you um, if you go and look at um, the .NET framework, really the .NET framework is another iteration on that concept of binary components that all can play together, um, just taken to the next level to make things even more interoperable so that um, you, you don't have to go through the low-level funny business that you have to do in COM to provide the same functionality. You can do it in .NET much easier. So it's really .NET, from my, this is my opinion, .NET is really another turn of the crank on the component object model incorporating all the things that they learned from writing you know thousands and thousands of people writing different com objects and in order to avoid you can write a com object in MFC no problem but MFC being so heavyweight they came up with an, a library for C++ that's template oriented it's called the active template library and that allows you to write an object that adheres to all the COM object specifications for interoperability, but without all the bloat of MFC, for all, you're not paying for all the stuff that you don't use, so your COM object can be very, very small. And then somebody got the idea of saying, hey, let's take all the things we learned about making COM objects with ATL and extend it to handle generic Windows GUI objects, whether they are controls or a full application, and they called that WTL, the Windows Template Library. And we, uh, Utah C++ programmers, gave a presentation on WTL a while back. That was before we were recording all our presentations. But in the end, with WTL, you can create a small native Windows GUI application and when I say small I mean it's like under a hundred kilobytes so very very small um, and that's because the Windows template library acts as a thin layer providing some abstractions around the typical needs of a Windows application which we'll go over what they are in a second and implements them in a very efficient way that kind of C++ is famous for you know not you don't pay for what you don't use if it's done correctly. Um, MFC provides a nice abstraction, but like I said, all the components are tightly coupled together, so you can't get a little bit of MFC. Once you get a little bit of MFC, you got all of MFC linked into your application. That's just how it works. It's the nature of the design of MFC. So, um, WinLAM is similar to WTL, and that allows you to create a native Win32 application, so there's no um, significant abstraction above the Windows API. There's really the abstraction that's provided as a matter of con convenience functions, and they tend to be very small. And so that's similar to WTL in that respect. It's not a heavyweight library like MFC, but unlike WTL, both WTL and MFC use a series of macros to organize what's called the um, dispatching of messages from Windows to application code that's responsible for responding to those messages. So, um, let's take a look at some code here. Okay, so here is a complete, let me make this font a little bigger for you. 
Here's a complete Windows application that has a simple main window and all it does is respond to a control click in the what's called the client area of the window and when you control click in there it displays a message that says you can control click at a the, the, at a certain X coordinate within the window so if we run this here's what it looks like I've got you know it defaults to this rather large area and just let's talk about a little bit of terminology in Windows so this area inside here is called the client area and that's owned by the application and then all the decorations around here like the title bar the minimize button the maximize button which for this window is not resizable so the mi the maximize button is disabled the close button and the little border which is a very thin like kind of one pixel blue line you can see here around things that's all owned by Windows and uh, by default it's drawn by Windows you can you can hook into everything in Windows and draw custom stuff in any of these fields or any of these non-client area regions that are owned by Windows but typically an application does not do that um, you just let Windows handle the redrawing of it so this is why when an application stops responding you might notice that the title bar and these little buttons and stuff they still get repainted and that's because they're being repainted by Windows not by the application but the way every GUI application works in every GUI framework that I've ever seen is they're all event driven so if you've written a console program right you implement the entry point to your program by writing the function main this is defined by the you know ISO C++ standard that that's the entry point for an application for C++ and for C there's a function called main and that's where control is handed over to your application in Windows the default entry point is called win main and we'll see what that looks like in a second but the main function of the win main application is to go into a message loop that receives messages from Windows determines what to do with those messages if anything and then dispatches to application code for the corresponding message that it wants to handle and do that forever until it receives a special message telling it that the application is to be terminated and then it exits the event loop so every Windows GUI application has to have some way of implementing that event loop and some way of identifying messages of interest and dispatching them to application code so I mentioned that this program if I uh, control click in here a little message box comes up says mouse click you know control click at position 495 if I dismiss that and control click somewhere else it now says I control clicked at position 129 and if I click the little close button the application exits so what the code that we have on screen is doing all the things that I just described we have a class that I've written that derives from this win domain class that's coming from winlam I implement a constructor and in the constructor I'm assigning a few values into this setup variable the setup variable is there to allow you to customize the initial appearance of the window before it's created and then I'm calling this on message function with a thing here this is WM this is a Windows message this is the create message and what's happening is I'm calling set text in there it's written as a lambda function the lambda function is capturing the this pointer because the set text method is a an instance method on this window class it's not written by me it's provided by this win ma window underscore main class or one of its base classes it takes a set of parameters this is describing the detail on the message so a create message and every other message has parameters that go with it that give you detail on the message so um, that's what the argument is the it is to the lambda is the uh, parameters for the message describing the detail of the message the return type of the function is l result and that 
has to do with how um, for a plain window that is the return type of what the message handler should return and the reason that that type is specified and not just allowed to be whatever you want is because the return code from the message handler actually goes back into Windows and then Windows decides what to do um, based on the return code so um, the type of this L result of this lambda is uh, mandated by the whole Windows uh, message dispatching mechanism. Windows calls it a message, other GUI frameworks call it an event, but it's the same concept. There's a thing that happened and you got to respond to it and you got to tell the system uh, what your response was. Um, the return zero here is the standard way of saying I have dealt with the message, you don't need to try and figure out who else it should go to. Uh, here's the button down message handler. It's taking a set of parameters as well. This time we've got, uh, well, as we did had with the create message, there's a specific way of taking the generic parameters that Windows sends with any message and cracking them. It's called a message cracker. Cracking them into a structure that is more relevant to the specific message that we're handling. In this case, because uh, for the bu left button down event, and by the way, it's called left, but if you go to the Windows GUI and the control panel and you switch the buttons between, le you know, to say that my primary button is the left button, what actually happens is, is that then the so called left button down, it's really the primary button down. So if you switch it to be left handed mousing, then left button down actually car happens when you click the right button. Uh, but it's historically it's named left button down before they had that ability to to switch the button assignments so just think of it as primary and secondary instead of left and right but everything's just called left in the API for historical reasons but left button down you can see inside here that I called a has control accessor on the message parameter to figure out if the control key was being held when the button was clicked the mouse button was clicked and then further I can drill in to those parameters and get the position that the mouse was in when you clicked on the window and I just call a message box to display that little message box there and I'm using uh, you know MB OK to say that the message box should have an OK button so let's just run it again to remind ourselves what that looked like so here's my window. Uh, you can't see it, but I'm holding the control key down. And if I click in there, here's the message box saying control click at position 304. And there's an OK button on here, but no cancel or any other buttons or decorations. And uh, you also can't see it, but if I just move my cursor around and I'm clicking here, nothing's happening because I'm not holding the control key down. So what is really going on here? Well, uh, I like to drill in top down so if we look down here at this run thing what's that doing well it and that macro ends up expanding into an implementation of win main so win main as I mentioned is the Windows main entry point for every Windows application and the signature of win main is uh, specified by Windows uh, and I mentioned that everything in Windows deals in really is dealing in objects but they're all referenced by handles so when you see things here like H instance that's a handle to an instance and if we drill in with the IDE we see that there's a we're in a header file provided by the the Windows SDK which you know sad to say that Microsoft keeps changing the name of the SDK now I think they even call it like the Windows kit but basically the Windows SDK, you might have heard you might have heard the name Platform SDK or uh, Windows SDK or um, the Windows Kit. And every time Microsoft releases a new version of Windows with new features, they issue a new SDK that exposes those new features to programmers. And that consists of libraries that you link against.
and header files that you include to get access to the new functions that you uh, can call for the newer version. So an each instance though has been around forever so it's not a thing you have to version test against. You see they have this little declare handle macro and if we drill into that declare handle macro we find out that all it's really doing is declaring a struct of some name and then the handle is declared as a pointer to that struct. So as I said it's an uh, and even in the, the the struct declaration you see it's kind of it's clearly this bogus thing with a it has to have some data inside the struct and in, in C you can't declare a struct that's empty it has to have something in it so they have an unused field declared in here but really that's all just a lie because that's not really what's stored in any of these handles it's just something to satisfy the syntax of the language really all you know is that it's a pointer to some chunk of memory all these handles are just pointers to chunks of memory uh, because they're opaque it's an implementation detail inside Windows what's actually inside this thing so you're what you're supposed to do is use the functions to get and set the interior guts of those objects by referencing them via their handle so win main it, it takes some handles it it takes a uh, this thing an LPW stir so let's just kind of talk briefly about how things in the Windows SDK which is what I'm going to call it their naming convention so you might guess that since it has stir in here this is some kind of string type and if we use our IDE to drill into that definition we see that it is uh, got some kind of annotation here that says it's null terminated and that LPW stir is a pointer to WCARE and WCARE is in C++ it's a WCARE-T so in C++ WCARE-T the width of WCARE-T is implementation defined but on Windows it's always a 16-bit Unicode character so it's called a WCARE because it's a wide character it's not 8 bits wide like ASCII or ANSI it's 16 bits wide per character and so that's now we know it's a string okay it's a it's a C style string that's null terminated but it's a string of wide characters so what's this LP business so the P business is just whenever Microsoft in their SDK declares a type that is a pointer to something so here is just PW stir it's a pointer to a wide null terminated string that's what PW star is so what's this LP star well as I said Windows started as a 16-bit DOS API and in the 16-bit land on x86 they had the so-called different memory models there was a, a pointer that was specified as a, a short offset relative to um, your current instruction pointer location so that was called a a near pointer and then you had long pointers which were 32-bit offsets relative to the instruction pointer and that represented a pointer to something that was farther away so the, the LP the L in LP is an anachronism it's just held over historically and so really there's no difference in current windows between a pointer and a long pointer they're all just pointers because it's a flat address space it's not a segmented address space like those 16-bit x86 CPUs had so there's no difference between a so-called short pointer a near pointer a far pointer or a long pointer they're all just pointers it, it doesn't matter but historically it's got LP it was a, a, a long pointer to a wide string this is the command line argument for win main and in Visual Studio if you're ever on a Windows API function and you want to see the documentation for it sometimes this breaks but most of the time it works that if you press F1 in the IDE it will launch into um, the online documentation for that particular function and you see here it's kind of brought me to the wrong place it brought me to w main not not win main 
uh, if we go back here and I hack this and I remove the W off of win main and just make it win main, press F1, now it's taking me to the right thing. So like I said, most of the time it works. It's still, you know, ever since they moved all their documentation online to a website, it used to ship as a local help file with the IDE, and I never had it fail when it was a local file in the IDE, but ever since they moved it off to the website, eh, most of the time it works. But what you can see here, now that we've got the correct documentation for WinMain, you can see there, okay, they've got this H instance parameter, a previous instance parameter, uh, the LP command line parameter, and this N show command. So what are all these funky uh, prefixes on the variable names in the documentation? It's a so-called Hungarian notation, which is, I think, an abomination. And even Microsoft has admitted that Hungarian notation is a bad idea because in .NET, they explicitly tell you not to use Hungarian notation in any APIs uh, in their coding style guideline. But like I said, historically, this is the way it's been. So. The H just means it's a handle, you know, the LP means it's a long pointer, the N means it's an integer. I wouldn't worry about trying to decode the meaning of variables from the Hungarian notation. It's C++. We've got the types. Look at the types that tells you what you need to know. But it's good to know that you can get to documentation for this Windows API because there's hundreds and hundreds of functions. You can't memorize them all. Um, and it's it's nice that it's cross-linked, you know, so it's telling you here this LP command line um, includes the command line excluding the program name. But if you want the whole command line, you can call this get command line function. Now, you, if you're sharp-eyed, you might have noticed that this is showing me the documentation for a function called get command line A and that the return type is LP stir and not LPW stir. So what's going on? Well, and you, if, you, if you look down here, there's mention of win main or W win main. So let's go back here and look at this a little more closely. If we look at LPW stir, we see the wide character versions. That's all good. But there's also, uh, if we look at what LP stir is, we see that it has a similar declaration, but it's for narrow characters. So cares and not WKRTs. So everything in Windows originated in a DOS before Unicode. And everything was dealing in narrow characters, so 8-bit characters. But for foreign language support, they used a thing called MBCS, which is multi-byte character uh, strings. And what this means is that if you wanted to represent a character in Japanese, you couldn't fit it all the Japanese characters into 8 bits. There's more than 256 Japanese characters. So what they did was kind of like the way UTF-8 encodes Unicode characters. There would be a little prefix byte, and then there would be subsequent bytes that would index into a larger set of characters so that a single character is now no longer represented by a single byte like it is in ANSI or in ASCII. So while that's fine, it does extend strings to working in non-Latin languages that rare can be represented with 256 character codes. It means that now I, if I need to count the number of characters in a string, I can't equivocate the number of characters to the number of bytes in the string because individual characters may be represented by multiple bytes and not every character is represented by multiple bytes only some of the characters are represented by multiple bytes so in order to count the number of characters in a string I have to decode the entire string and figure out which bytes correspond to so-called multi-byte characters and which bytes correspond to single byte characters that's a lot of extra work so Unicode 
treats everything as fixed width character code in Windows it's 16-bit Unicode in full-blown Unicode on Unix it will be 32 bits per character and that means if I need to compute the number of characters I just take the number of bytes and divide it by the size of the character and now I have the number of characters in a string I don't have to do any funky decoding of individual bytes so when Windows introduced 16-bit Unicode as its internationalization strategy to replace MBCS that was used in DOS they introduced the wide character type the WCAR however to maintain source code compatibility with existing programs they engaged in some preprocessor hackery so if we go to use our IDE to drill into I guess I can't go in there let's try another function here let's drill into this I bet there's a function in here we can go into drill in a little further we'll look at this in a second explain what it all means all right down here load accelerators so inside all the Windows header files you will see that there are two versions of every function defined there is a function with the a suffix and there's a function with the w suffix and the a suffix is for all the ANSI applications and the a suffix function has the arguments declared with narrow character strings the w functions have the functions declared with wide character strings and then there's this goofy preprocessor hackery down here that says if you didn't specify in your source code whether you were explicitly calling the wide character function or whether you were calling the narrow character function we will look at this Unicode macro and if that's defined we will use a macro for the agnostic string wideness version of the function in this case load accelerators we'll define that to the wide character one otherwise we'll define it to the ANSI one so coming back here what that all means is when you look at Windows documentation and it's get command line A you're looking at the ANSI version of the function and all that's going to be different between the ANSI version and the Unicode version is that all the character types will be all, all the data types that are have some kind of sensitivity to strings there'll be the narrow versions on the a function that will all be declared like LP stir and there'll be the wide character functions that are all declared with the W types like LPW stir and you can see over here in the index that the very next function is get command line W and if we look at the documentation for that sure enough the only thing that's different is this function has a different name it's got the W suffix and the return type is a pointer to a wide character string not a pointer to a narrow character string I mention all this crap not because you actually need to know about it on a day-to-day -day basis everything in WinLAM is using wide character strings every the native string format in modern Windows is all wide character the narrow character entry points into Windows are there for backwards compatibility and what happens when you call them is the first thing it does is convert all the narrow strings to wide strings then it calls the real function and if there's any return values that come out that are strings it takes the wide strings that came out from Windows and narrows them down to narrow strings and gives you back the narrow strings so if you care about efficiency you should just always use the wide character functions which is why that's what WinLAM does WinLAM doesn't use any narrow character entry points because it's stupid okay it's also not Unicode aware but I mention all that crap so that when you look at documentation you understand why does this one have an A why does that one have a W what is the difference between the two now you understand 
But now that you understand this difference, you probably realize, like, you don't actually need to know much about what that difference is just to understand that there is one and what it means. Now, there's an even weirder thing that Microsoft did, which was at the transition point between DOS and so-called Windows NT style Windows, Windows NT was always wide character string native. But DOS versions of Windows, like Windows 95 and Windows 98, Windows ME was the last one, but that's such an abomination, even Microsoft admits it was a mistake. But Windows 98, say, was the last Windows where the ANSI strings were the native string representation. And to bridge that time frame where you had to maybe ship an application that would be compiled for both platforms, they had a weird thing they called a T-STIR and a T-CARE. And this was basically, if you used a T-CARE and you compiled without Unicode defined, then T-CARE turned into CARE. And if you used a T-CARE with Unicode defined, then a T-CARE turned into a W-CARE. And then instead of using the functions with the uh, W or A suffix or prefix, you would always use the, the agnostic functions. And you could com take all your code and it would be source code compatible. You just build it one way with Unicode turned off and you could ship it for DOS based Windows, Win98 say. Or you could turn Unicode on and ship it for Windows NT. Now this was an endless source of bugs, right? Because people would just always mix together the wide and the narrow strings and didn't realize that the, what the T-Care thing was actually doing. So, it, you know, it, it's, it's a clever trick to get you source code compatibility, but it, it's also a source of problems. So, again, we don't care about narrow string entry points on any modern windows it hasn't been that way since windows 2000 that was 20 years ago we don't want to program to old stuff so you just always use the wide character entry points always use wide character strings explicitly and you'll be happy and taking the fast path having said all that now you understand why these string literals have the l prefix this is the um, I forget what C++ calls it in the standard, but it's the, it's the prefix on a string literal that says the characters in the literal are to be turned into W care T characters, not care characters. So everything in WinLAM, all the string constants, the uh, string literals that I'm using here, they all have that L prefix on there to turn them into wide character string literals. Now you might say to yourself, hey, I actually know something about Unicode and 16-bit wide character uh, characters is not the way Unicode works on Linux. And you would be correct. Everything in Linux deals in UTF-8. And unless you are using a more modern version of the C++ standard, the way to express Unicode string literals is as a care star because UTF-8 is one or more 8-bit codes where it's, a, it's like MBCS, except it's a Unicode multibyte encoding where you have the same kind of problem. That to count up the number of characters in a UTF-8 encoded string, you have to decode all the characters because you don't know which ones in the middle represent pieces of a character or an entire character. The only way to know that is to scan the string from the front. So... Having spent way too much time on all that Unicode junk, let's get back to our run macro here, which is providing the message loop that is important to every program that is operating in an event-driven GUI framework. So that, that macro expands into an implementation of WinMain, and all that does is delegate to a templated run main function, and it passes in two of the four parameters. It doesn't pass in this previous instance parameter or the command line. As we saw in the documentation, if you really want to get the command line, you can call that function get command line to get the command line. Uh, this previous instance thing, it's a historical anachronism and also isn't needed anymore in a modern application, so it's omitted. If we drill into that templated function, we see that here it is. Um, and 
it's instantiating the type that was given as the template parameter to create an instance of that type and then it calls the win main run on that type so what does that really mean for our code well our code the type that's passed in is this simple main window so if we drill into this and it's deriving from winlam's window main class if we drill into that we see there's a bunch of junk in here but the part we are interested in down here is the message loop and we see that inside here it uh, and does some initialization stuff uh, does some more initialization stuff and then eventually it delegates down to this thing called run loop and if we look at run loop here is the main message loop it's creating an instance of this message structure that's a win32 structure that represents a message if you want to take a look inside you see that it's got some you know data members in it that are filled in by windows when we get a message back from windows this is the stuff that I said the uh, whenever you get a message it comes with a bunch of you know information this is the information that it comes with every message comes with this stuff a message may come with additional information but this is the the stuff that every message comes with so we have an instance of that message structure we're calling get message w to get that structure filled in by windows uh, this represents some error handling that's not particularly important um, and there's a bunch of funny business here that special cases of how different particular portions of um, windows and it's small w windows so like windows on the screen how a different styles of windows respond uh, need to be handled in order to handle their messages properly uh, then we call uh, translate message and dispatch message now what you probably noticed if you are again eagle-eyed is that uh, this is a windows function translate message uh, dispatch message is a Windows function. These uh, little query things is dialog message, translate accelerators. Those are Windows functions. There's this little bit of custom code from WinLAM here. If we drill into that, you see it's got some additional logic to, you know, look uh, loop over a bunch of modeless child windows and check to see if it's a window or if it's a dialog message. So that's, um, again, ultimately boiling down to some calls into Windows itself. Uh, so how does the stuff get out of this loop and back into our application code? Well, the answer, my friends, was on some code that we skipped. If we go back and look inside here, uh, let's go down this way, go down to the run, and it ends up calling this function where it instantiates this type okay so what happens in the constructor of this type that seems to be where something interesting is happening if we go look at the constructor here it is this is the base class that I am deriving from so the base classes are all just constructed bottom-up until they get to my code uh, this is just initializing something that wraps a window handle there's this base message pub M thing. Uh, it appears to be a bunch of internal machinery to WinLAM. And there's this base thread pub M that again appears to be some in machinery in WinLAM and base text pub M. Again, more machinery inside WinLAM. So those base classes don't appear to do too much. So what's going on inside the body of the constructor? There's this uh, setup styles business, which is uh, initializing some common uh, defaults that are useful for typical Windows applications in that setup variable that we looked at. Since that is all happening in the base class before we get to my code, if I'm not happy with any of those defaults, I can replace them here and put different values. Or in, in the case of this style member, I'm adding on something and leaving it um, I'm taking the values that they gave me and adding on a new flag instead of replacing it like I did with the title here.
Okay, so there's all of that. Um, and then there seems to be this uh, on message thing. Okay, um, so maybe what's happening is in, so that's all in the constructor. So the constructor didn't seem to wire in any of my application callback code into the handling of messages. So that clear, appears to be happening a little bit somewhere else. Here's the the win main run in the base class that I'm using. If you if we recall back over here, this run macro expanded into a little thing that just called that win main run function. Here's the one that I'm getting from my base class. I could I could write my own that would be used instead of this one. But the interesting part is happening in this register create. And then finally down here we see here's this call to create window ex this is the thing that creates the main window now in win in, in win32 you can't receive a message without a window so at the very, even even if you don't put a window on the screen if you're interested in events like mouse clicks anywhere on the screen or mouse movement anything like that you have to create some kind of window because Messages are, are sent to the message queue associated with a window. And we saw that there was that message loop that got a message and then it translated it and then it dispatched it. But we didn't see any call into our code at that point where we, you know, at, at dispatch message you kind of expect like, well, shouldn't that be taking like a pointer in my code and calling my function when it dispatches the message? How does it know to get back into my code when a message is dispatched? And the answer to that is that if we if we look at the documentation for create window ex, uh, went to my other screen. Um, there's this thing that's the window class. So again, object oriented. In w in Win32, individual windows are all instances of a particular class of window type and you register the window class type with Windows itself with Win32 through this register class function. And if we drill into register class, it takes this pointer to this structure and we drill into the structure. And then finally, here's this thing called the window proc, the wind proc. This is the thing that receives the messages. So if you were doing this all by hand, raw, Win32, you would create one of these Win class EX structures, fill it out. One of the members is a pointer to a function that processes the messages as they've been dispatched to your window. So if it's, an, if it's a message that's not handled by Windows itself, it ends up going to you. It ends up coming in through this function pointer. So you have to take that function pointer, attach it to a member of this structure. You have to take the rest of that structure, fill out the appropriate members to register an appropriate window class. Having registered the window class, you can now create a window that is an instance of that class. And then when the message loop runs, eventually it'll come back through this wind proc. And that's a big pain. And that's what C programmers did in Windows when they were writing applications. That's a bunch of boilerplate junk that we don't want to have to keep writing. And that's what WinLAM is doing for us. WinLAM has implemented the main message loop. It's implemented that window proc that gets registered with the class. And here you see in my setup variable, I've set the, the class name of all the windows that I'm going to create. Um, it's the class name of which I will use to create instances of this window class type. But what I really want to do is just write something simple like this. Say, when I get the create message, call this Lambda. And that's what WinLAM is doing for us. WinLAM provides this onMessage function. It takes a um, message identifier. If we if we drill in on the IDE, what these are, they're just they're just pound defines that correspond to different values. I mean, in a, 
if we were writing this from scratch today, it would probably be like an enum class, but it's a C API and it's, you know, historically legacy, you know, kind of way of looking at things. So it's just a pound to find. So this handler gets associated with this message type, this message identifier, if you will. And since it's a Lambda and we captured our, this pointer, we can call methods on this class. So that can be methods of our own. For instance, if I did this, I would say, oops, just to show you what's going on here. If I say L result, do stuff, and then I take this code down here, and then I say do stuff here, and put this code up here, and run this. What did I do wrong? Oh, I have to say return do stuff. Must return a value. Okay. So we can see that the window was created. Do stuff ran because it changed the title of this window. So the fact that I was calling, you know, a winlam method here provided by this base class or one of its ancestors, or whether I'm calling my own method doesn't doesn't really matter, okay? Uh, because I'm capturing the this pointer to this class to my own class, I'm not capturing the pointer to the base. Okay, so in that Windows that wind proc that we would have written if we were doing this all by hand, traditionally the way that looks is a giant switch statement on these message identifiers, and then maybe within each of those messages there would be another switch statement to decide like oh it was a button down but it was a button down for the for the button or it was a button down for the text box or it was a button down for this area where you you draw with the cur with the mouse so i get to figure out which thing you clicked on and switch on that and it could be a, get to be a big mess in early 90s style windows applications i'm sure you can probably find some on github because there's like 30 year old code on github easily you will see the giant switch statement or if you look at programming books from the 90s that are trying to tell you how to write a windows program there's a giant switch statement on all these message types it gets unwieldy so winlam implements all that junk for you and lets you use on message to say when this message gets sent to me run this code and that results in WinLAM implementing all that boilerplate stuff for us. We don't need this little junk here anymore. That was just for explanation. We end up with a really short one page of code that implements a complete Windows application. So that was um, one way of doing a Windows application where you so-called you create your so-called main window and we don't when we, you know, our window was empty, it didn't have anything in it. It responded to some events, but it didn't have any stuff in it. And when you want to do like a real application, you're going to have controls inside the window and you're going to want to wire up those controls to your own event handlers. Now, you can certainly create controls. A, a, a Windows control, by the way, in other uh, frameworks, you might have heard them called widgets. Uh, WX widgets refers to a generic reusable interface component as a widget. Uh, X Windows system referred to them as widgets. Windows calls them controls. So, like on my screen here, I have these little, you know, this is a tabbed, so called tabbed window, and each tab is a control. And then inside here, this is a, a combo box drop down. So it's got a little control that's the little drop down button and it's got a control that's showing what's currently selected and then when I click this another control is shown that displays this little drop down menu where I can pick one of the things every menu item on a menu is a control and when I click on the menu item the pop-up menu that's created as a control and all the individual items within here including the little separator bars those are all controls so somebody has to instantiate all that junk and for a complicated UI, 
doing all of that in code is tedious and error prone. So what you really want to do is use what's uh, called in Windows is resources. And resources allow you to put all the controls on a piece of screen real estate graphically using an editor inside Visual Studio. We'll see what that looks like in a second. And you stick the controls typically on a dialog. So we saw an example of the message box. It's a system provided dialog, dialog box. And it has some parameters that let us control like what's the text that's displayed inside the message box? What's the text that's displayed on the title of the message box? What kind of buttons are on the message box? Does it have an OK button or an OK button plus a cancel button? But once you get into your own dialogues, that's not sufficient. You know, putting all those parameters on there and little doohickey flags, that would be cumbersome. So if we look at our next example, here it's similar to what we had before, except in de instead of deriving from window main, we are now deriving from dialog main. And you see that the setup code is a little bit different. The um, create message for a dialog is called init dialog, whereas for a plain window, it's called create. And these little differences, I mean, there's just no way getting around it. It's just you got to learn the Win32 API if you want to program at this level. Uh, we still have our little left button down handler here. We've got new handlers for cancel and OK buttons on a typical dialog. And why would you want to do things through a dialog instead of that main window? And the answer is because with a dialog, let me get this over so you can see it. In the, uh, in the dialog application, I've got this RC, which is a resource script. We'll take a look at what that looks like as a text file in a second. But Windows understands resource scripts and understands how to interpret those scripts as a visual representation in the resource view in Visual Studio. So I've got a dialog in here that's identified by this IDD main. And if I double click that, I've got here's my visual representation of the dialog. And Visual Studio has this little toolbox, I can start dragging controls from this toolbox in the dialog editor uh, tab here. I can start dragging these controls and placing them over on the dialog. So I can visually design my user interface. How do I attach code to the items that I'm creating here in this user interface uh, designer? The way that that happens is every control let me get this window over here so you can see it. Oops, that was the wrong thing to do. Oh, now I did something goofy. All right, let's try this again. Click this, F4. Properties, here it is. All right, let's try this again drag this over here so you can see it. Let's put it down there. Okay, so when I've got something selected in the visual resource designer, you see there's here's all these properties associated with that thing that is selected. You'll notice down here the text for the caption. Yeah, it's main dialog, but I can make it anything I want. And when I accept the value down in the property editor, it changes up here in the visual view. I'll just put it back to what it was instead of something silly. But the important thing down here is, you see here is an ID field. This field is editable. And it says it has an ID of IDD underscore main. So it's just kind of convention that IDD is the identifier, you know, these are turn all to preprocessor macros. So they all have to have unique names. They're not scoped. And so people put prefixes on there to identify them unique within a certain category. So IDD is this, you know, kind of convention for identifiers that are the resource IDs that 
correspond to dialogues. If we go back to our code, if again, if you were eagle-eyed, you might have noticed that IDD main was what I assigned into my setup structure as the dialog ID for this window. And what happens under the covers is that this visual representation turns into a little script. That script is stored in this .rc file. That little script gets fed into a program called the resource compiler that takes this textual representation of uh, the script representation of the, the, the visual design that we're seeing on the screen in the um, resource editor takes that little script, compiles it into a binary representation, and then when our code runs, it uses this ID, which is associated with the binary representation. That binary representation that comes out of the resource compiler gets linked into your executable as just a blob of data that's in your executable, and you call a Windows function with this ID to get access to the byte array that represents that blob of data and then you can tell Windows to go and create a dialog based on that blob of data. So Windows does all that for you. Win32 rather does all that for you. And the base class here, let's make this guy not permanently popped out. The dialog main takes that ID and in the startup code before it runs the message loop it does everything I just said gets access to that binary blob of data takes that binary blob of data uses it to instantiate a dialog through a Windows API call and then it shows that window on screen and then starts running the, the, the message loop and our event handlers here are going to be called when the right message comes in for the, that's registered with the handler now Again, if you were eagle-eyed, you might have noticed, uh-oh, this return value for these lambdas, it changed from an L result to an int underscore pointer, and that's because dialogs, again, all these little quirks and differences are just part of the Win32 API, but a the window procedure associated with a dialog has a different signature than the... Um, Windows procedure associated with a regular window like we looked at in the first example so the return value is different here on your lambda other than that it's it's very similar except now you know you might have noticed we're returning true from the handler to indicate that we're done with the message whereas the other example we were returning zero again just differences between the dialog the, the message processing procedure for a dialog versus the message processing procedure for a window. And we're also using init dialog as the way to do our one-time setup stuff. So if we look at this program when we run it, uh, I'm gonna say no and no I made it think I changed some things by don't do that oh now it's unhappy hold on the I gotta say the dialogue editor is pretty fussy inside Visual Studio alright let's try this again if we run okay so it built my code and now you see I've got a st kind of standard dialogue looking type window here it's got an OK button and a cancel button and if I control click down here it's saying I control clicked at position 149 like before and in just case you were curious to see what happens here we can put breakpoints in these lambdas and run with the debugger and notice the window isn't on the screen yet uh, I've hit this breakpoint I can step into this code if I want to this little set text method is just a wrapper around set window text w it provides the window handle as the first argument to this a windows api function because remember i said everything is just really objects and it's always the handle is passed as the first argument so that's a windows call and in winlam uh, they use kind of what's uh, called a, a builder pattern so whenever you call the winlam
convenience function, it returns a reference to the um, to the class. So I could, you know, I because it returned a reference, I could call set text again here, you know, another title. And if we run that, now the dialog will say it'll do this this first set text. This uh, let's show you what's going on here. If we bring this window over, you can see that, okay, it's a new title for the dialog. This is the first one. And then it called the second one. I stepped over it, but you can see it changed the, the dialog title now. says another title. So it, it did this one, returned a reference, and you can just chain up the methods. In this case, I, my example is silly. I'm, I'm calling set text twice. Uh, just overwriting the value I wrote the first time, but if there's a bunch of things you need to set on the window, you can just chain them all all together. It's kind of convenient. It's an example of what they call the builder pattern. Um, let's get rid of this breakpoint and put a breakpoint down here in the OK handler. So if I continue, here's my little dialog. You know, if I press Control click, I get that functionality executed. If I press cancel. It went through this handler, so we didn't we didn't get down to this code. But it's easy to um, debug these things because you can just put breakpoints in them directly, and it and it'll hit that code. So if you use a dialog as your main window, you get the advantage of being able to use the resource editor in Visual Studio, and you can drag controls onto the dialog, and through their IDs, you associate message handlers back up with um, either the, st the standard IDs like ID cancel and ID OK that represent the OK and cancel buttons on the dialog, which you can, I mean, that kind of comes in when you create a dialog in Visual Studio, but it, it you can remove them. There's nothing magical about those controls. Uh, in the resource view here, you see here's my little resource script, and then there's this dialog category. I can uh, add a resource. It'll add another dialog. I can be up here and I can say, you know, I can add a resource of another type, either um, an icon or a menu or what have you. Uh, so in addition to using the toolbox, you can use the context menu here in the resource view to add controls onto a dialog. Okay, but once you add them on there, how do you actually get them attached in WinLamp? And that's the next example we'll look at. We'll look at code here, not the resource view. I did say I would show you Oops. and we're in So inside here is this, the resource script. I'm just showing it to you this way instead of directly in Visual Studio because Visual Studio really wants you to manipulate everything through the visual editor. And when you open it up in the code editor, then it kind of gets unhappy saying it's already open in another editor. But I wanted to show you what this resource script stuff looks like. This uh, include resource.h is the thing that ends up defining numerical values for all these little symbols and you'll see down here is this IDD main which was a pound defined for the identifier corresponding to our dialog here's a dialog EX statement so here's the initial um, I can't remember one of the these are like you know either the X and Y position and the width and height of the dialog here's uh, stuff specifying the initial style of the window. Here's the initial caption. Here's stuff specifying the font that's to be used. And then this begin and end um, wraps the controls that are instantiated on that dialog. So as I said, you get the kind of default OK and cancel buttons, which have the standard ID OK and ID cancel IDs and their position on the dialog and their size uh, of the buttons. So this resource script, and again, it's another thing you can read about in the Visual Studio documentation. You normally don't need to muck around with the resource script itself. You just use the visual editor, and, and it works out just fine. But we haven't yet shown you how to attach 
handlers to custom controls that you put on the dialogue. So if we look over here at this uh, okay, dialogue control, so if we look at this main dialogue, you see I've got an edit box on here. And if we look at our properties up, the edit box has an identifier IDC action text. And there's this button which has identifier IDC action button and those are in addition to the standard OK and cancel buttons that are on a dialogue when you create a, a, a dialogue from the visual editor. So if we go look at the code for this example, let's get rid of some of this stuff. Okay, so just like before, we're specifying the ID of the dialogue resource that's gonna that we're gonna use for our main window. I've called it IDD main again. There's nothing magical about these names. These are two different executables and they have two different header files, both called resource.h, but they have two different header files that are that are defining these IDs. So if in the ID, if I just drill in, oh, don't do that. Uh, it, do, it doesn't want to show me that, but if I hover over it, it says it's a macro and it has a value 101. So before, in our init dialog processing, the only thing we did was assign a new title to the dialog. But here, <coughs> Winlam gives us little wrapper classes around a bunch of the stock controls in Windows that are just, again, conveniences and in your init dialog, what you do is, excuse me, what you do is call this assign method on the little wrapper to say this is the, the parent window and this is the ID, or rather this is the pointer to the thing that's the dialog class, right? I mean, it's the, all the controls, the parent windows are the dialogs, uh, is the dialog window. And this is the ID for this control and now I can again use that kind of daisy chain set method to set some properties on the button you might have noticed when we looked at the dialogue in the visual designer this didn't you know this said sample edit box and this said button one that's not really what I want and and the, and the title here is called dialogue it's not really useful to what I want so um, it looks like I didn't set the title on the dialog here, so it's still just going to say dialog. But the button, I'm going to change its text to action. I'm going to give the button the initial focus and the text box control. I'm going to set the text inside there to initial action text. And then um, I've got additional command handlers on the text box and the button. And what's going on is if I get a change notification on the text box, I'm going to enable the button if the text in the text box is not empty. So the idea is I'm going to have some text in the text box. And if that text is not empty, I'm going to enable the button. And when I click the button, then something is supposed to happen. We're supposed to take an action. And so for the button if I get a clicked notification then I'm going to display a message box here I'm using in the previous code I was just using the raw Windows message box function here I'm using his little wrapper from Winlam around that the convenience there is that it takes wide string you know it stood W string as a wide string uh, argument for the text that is to be displayed in the message box. This is the message box title. So if I run this, okay, here's my dialog box. Here's my controls. You see that the text was changed from that sample edit box thing, and this no longer says button one, it says action. And if I edit in here, but I delete all the text then the button is disabled if I type some text in there the button is enabled again and if I click the action button then it shows 
a message box with that text you know shown in there now that's all fine and dandy I mean this is a really simple program we can kind of look at it visually and just say hey that that looks all looks correct you know that's all fine but as you start getting more and more dialogues and the interaction between the events the messages coming from Windows and the business logic that's supposed to happen on the back end starts getting more and more complicated you start looking at this code and you say how can I test this code because this code here that does my business logic it's all glued directly into the message handler and like the only way I can really test it is kind of sending this message into this GUI application and now it's starting to look like the only way to test the business logic behind my GUI application is to create some kind of automated robot that's going to click on buttons and type into text into fields and stuff and that all gets to be very fragile because if you've ever worked on any kind of GUI application the very first thing that happens when you deploy it is people say could you move this control a little bit up and make this text box a little bit wider and you know maybe put the button in a different place so when you try to do some kind of event playback into a GUI application, as soon as you change the position, size, uh, and orientation of any of the controls, all your recorded event playbacks for your tests all break because everything's all moved around. And people try to get fancier and fancier and fancier on the event playback, and personally, I just think that's a mistake. The better way to test things is to move the logic from where it's difficult to test to somewhere else where it's easy to test. And then we can just write unit tests. So what does that look like? Well, I've got this same application, but I transformed it so that it's testable. So let's, what does it look like in its testable form? Okay, so <clears throat> here's this thing. I just changed the name of the class, but it's essentially similar it's deriving from that dialog main it's also deriving from this other thing over here public dialog and you can probably guess by the casing on there that that's a thing that I wrote that didn't come from WinLAM you also see down here in addition to the two little WinLAM wrappers around my controls I've got a thing in here called a mediator and that mediator is connected to my class that implements my GUI it's actually connected to this abstract interface which we're going to look at in a second and I've added a bunch of public methods that are overriding the abstract methods on this dialog interface I've added a bunch of public methods on my class that represents my dialog window my uh, init dialog doesn't look any different. This is all just GUI infrastructure. It's not doing any application logic. Maybe you might consider this initial text to be application logic. I could um, inject that text as arguments into my constructor, store them in member variables, and then use the member variables down here. But the more interesting thing is that now all my event handlers my lambdas that I'm using with WinLAM, all they're doing is delegating to methods on the mediator. So now all my business logic has moved out of this class that is tightly coupled to the Windows GUI, moved on to another class that I can unit test. And if we, rem if, well, instead of remembering, let's just go back and look at this for a second inside here there was times where I was digging into these control wrappers on the main window class and I was extracting some information so what I've done is instead of calling that directly I've exposed that as a public method on this dialog class that I've written and that's so the mediator can call this code without having to dip directly into the control wrappers so it's now decoupled from the controls it's also decoupled from my business logic that is so my business logic is all in the mediator which we'll look at in a second but uh, the, the business logic is no longer directly displaying message boxes or anything like that it's calling the methods 
to do those things to interact with the GUI, it's calling messages on the dialog, or calling methods on the dialog. So this is the abstract interface that this dialog implements. It has a method to enable the action button. It has a method to get the action text. That's the text out of that text edit control. It has a method to do the perform action logic, which in our case was just displaying a piece of GUI, but that could be something else. It has a method to uh, display the click position, and it has a close method. Uh, the close method, for instance, if we go look at that, it's the thing that's sending the close message to uh, to the to this window, and then Windows will dispatch that to us. And uh, the standard dialog procedure for any dialog knows how to close a dialog when it receives a close event. So um, that's handled by the standard dialog procedure, and we just need to put that message into the queue for this window. So that's what send message is doing. So our mediator, now what I've done is I've pulled it out into a separate little library. Uh, I'll show you why I've done that in a second. But here's my mediator. So if we look at uh, its declaration, all of the methods on the mediator have the signature of what looks like a WinLAM event handler. And that's so I can put all the decision making inside these functions and that's what allows me to, when I wire them in, I can just delegate directly. I don't need to do any other logic on these parameters, and I don't need to do any logic on the, on the return types. It's just pure delegation. So these event handlers, I don't need to test this code because I can just see it's correct by inspection, by its pure delegation. There's no decision making taking place over there. All the decision making is taking place in this mediator. This mediator interacts with the dialog through a an abstract interface. This abstract interface here that our concrete dialog implemented. So that's a pure virtual interface. It has no implementation. So this mediator interacts with an abstraction, not with the concrete GUI dialog. It's interacting with an abstraction that um, we will take a look at as we look inside the mediator. So, it, for instance, on that left button down, we previously had this logic directly in our Lambda that was being passed to WinLAM, but I've just moved it over here. So it's, you know, checking to see if the control modifier was present on the event, the L button down event that came in, event message, I kind of use the two terms interchangeably. So if the control was down, we're going to go get the position out of the message. And then after we've built our little display string, we're going to call back into the dialog and tell it that it needs to display um, the click position. This is the, the title that it should just use for that display. And this is the message or, or the uh, text that should go in there. And then down similarly down here, when we get a command message sent to the action text control we're going to look at that notification code if it was a change notification meaning the meaning the text in the control has changed we're going to fetch the text from the dialog if it was not empty then we will enable the action button on the dialog so what what does that mean for the tests so I've the reason that I pull that out into a little library, so that library is referenced by the dialog application, but it's also referenced by my test code, which I've uh, implemented as a little bit of gtest test cases. I'm using uh, gmock as well. So I, I won't go into the details of a full GMock GTest tutorial, but what I'm doing is I here I'm making a mock dialog and I'm instantiating that mock dialog for every test case. I'm instantiating the mediator connected to the mock dialog. So the thing I'm testing is the mediator. The mediator collaborates with an abstract dialog. The abstract dialog is what I'm mocking. 
So uh, this is a, just a simple test that says I should be able to construct these things and tear them down without any errors that happens as a result of this test class being instantiated and destroyed by gtest. This is a test f, which is an, it's a fixture test case where this is the fixture class that represents the state that's created and destroyed for every test case. This is the name of the test case. For the, for the create and destroy test case, I don't need to do anything besides what's happening in the fixture. Um, here I've got a test case that says if I get a left button click but there's no modifiers, then nothing else should happen to the dialog. So I'm just calling left button down with the suitable params that I've created. These are just simple structs, so I can just create them by you know, providing the appropriate initializers for the fields and the structs to give me the params to a message. I call left button down with those params, get the result back, and I expect the result to be true, and I, nothing should have happened to the mock dialog. Now, if it's control held down when I left button click, uh, which I've changed the little event initializer to, sh to say that the control key modifier was present. I expect that on the mock dialog, it should have called display click position, and the underscores here just represent wildcard arguments. So all I'm saying is, if the control button was held when the left button click was received, then um, it should have called display click position. And that's what this uh, expectation on the mock sets up. To go a little further, I say it now I'm going to say it should have called display click position with this exact text for this exact set of message params that has a position of 10 comma 15. The message should say control click at position 10 and the title should have been mouse click. So this first test was just saying if the control was held down when the button click came in, it should have called display click position. It, it should have called it with something. I don't, I don't care what it called it with, but it should have called display click position. Now I'm testing that it was called with the specific message. And similarly for the other um, methods on the mediator, I'm testing them all. And kind of the one that's kind of interesting is here saying if I had the change notification on the action text control so a command message with a change notification code on the action uh, text widget this getter it can call it as many times as it wants but we're going to return some non-empty text on that getter and that means it should have called enable action button true on the dialog so it's a little bit more involved because I'm setting up an expectation. Usually for getters, you set up the expectation that it doesn't matter how many times you call a getter, um, especially if, it, if the data is not changing on the getter. You just say, will repeatedly. It's just going to keep returning that string no matter how many times you call because I don't, I don't care how many times action text command asked for the text. All I care is that when it asks, we give it this value non-empty, and that given a non-empty value, I care that it and called enable action button with true. This is the other case where the text came back empty, and it called enable action button false. So, as usual with testing, uh, if you just want to see what that looks like uh, from CMake. Um, I'm doing a fine package to get gtest. This is my test executable. And the reason that I pulled that mediator out into a separate library is so that I could just have the test depend on the mediator and not, y you can't link against an executable, right? You can only link against libraries. So to pull that mediator out and make it testable, I pulled it into a library so my test code could link against the mediator to, to uh, test it and my my dialogue code 
uh, sorry, this is the code for the mediator library. So it consists of that abstract interface, the implementation of the library, and uh, the library uses data types from WinLAM. So it links against WinLAM. And then the, the code itself here for the dialogue, it links against the mediator as well. It doesn't link against the tests. It doesn't need the test code. It just needs the implementation of the mediator. Um, I'll be pushing all this code up onto GitHub so you can kind of take a look at it later. Now, WinLAM is Windows only, right? So why did I use CMake? Well, CMake can be handy for uh, things, for instance, like finding my dependencies. I can use VC package. I can find WinLAM with that. I can find GTest with that. I don't have to worry about, you know, magic install locations on my machine. I can re easily refactor my code into libraries, as I've done here with this little mediator library. Um, and then I just use CMake to regenerate the project structure that Visual Studio consumes, and it all works fine. Uh, and it also is the case that if we just look up here, um, when you add resource files to a project in CMake, it understands that files named in .rc need to be compiled with the resource compiler. I think it understands that by default. It doesn't hurt to explicitly say that the language is RC to tell it that the resource compiler should be used to compile those source files, the resource scripts. The other thing you need to know if you're doing this from CMake is when you add your executable, you need to put this Win32 keyword on the call to add executable so that when CMake links your application, it links it using the Windows subsystem and not the console subsystem. If you use Visual Studio directly, the way that looks like so the test program here is a console program so if we take a look at the system setting under linker in the project properties you'll see that the subsystem is specified as console whereas if we look at one of our GUI programs we'll see that the subsystem is specified as Windows that's how the um, create process mechanism on Windows knows to invoke win main versus invoking main. It's whether or not the subsystem is console or Windows. If it's console, then it's main that gets invoked. If it's Windows, then it's win main that gets invoked. Now, previously when we did a presentation on WTL, I had a little program that snooped the keyboard. Why is that? Oh, because that's a folder. That's not the project. Here's the project. Set as startup. So this little program here, I, I won't drill into all the details of it. Let's just go down to the bottom here. Um, you see that I've done this program that it's, it's a Windows main. And <coughs> instead of using that run macro, so before we had something that looked like this, oops, run in caps with an open print. And it's the name of this little class. All right, so before when we looked at this, you know, it expanded into this little call here and it took the command show argument and passed it down. Well, in this case, the point of this program is to not display a window, but just, as I said before, the only way to get messages is if you have created a window. Now, that window does not have to be visible to receive messages. Obviously, if it's not visible, it won't receive any messages relating to it being visibly interacted with. It won't receive mouse events, and it won't receive click events and things like that, but it can still receive events. And the purpose of this program is to snoop the clipboard and when the contents of the clipboard change, what I want to do is grab the contents of the clipboard and save them out to a file. And the way you do that in Windows is you add a, you call this add clipboard format listener to start listening to the clipboard and the messages are sent to the window argument. So when my window is created, 
Now it's uh, initially created hidden because I, instead of using that boilerplate run, which passes down the command show f that you get from Windows, when you when you launch a program in Windows, it, it normally launches it saying SW show to show the windows of the of the show the main window of the program that you just launched, which is normally what you want. In my case, I want my window to stay hidden. So instead of taking the value that's passed into WinMain, I'm using SW hide and I'm hiding my little window here and I'm going to register on the create and deregister on the destroy for uh, clipboard formats. And then I'm going to listen for clipboard update messages. And when I get one of those, I'm going to call into this little snooper class that I've written. Uh, th this class doesn't really do anything with a window per se. It's only interacting with the clipboard. Um, I am using these little uh, com interface pointer helper classes and methods from WinLAM. They're down in these little WinLAM internals header files, but you know, everything in WinLAM is just a header only library, so I don't have a problem calling into a header down in the internals folder. Um, but I can save the bitmap on the clipboard as a PNG file by using these little this little Windows imaging classes imaging factory com API. Um, and so when I run this program, there's no window that's displayed. But if we go back over here and browse this code, here's the clipboard update handler. Here's I'll put a breakpoint here so we can verify ourselves that this is really being called. Let's get this out of the way. So if I take this text inside Visual Studio and I select it, it's not on the clipboard yet, but if I type Control C to copy it onto the clipboard, now we've gotten a clipboard update message. I go into my snooper here. Um, there's a little sequence number associated with a clipboard so you can make sure that you're tracking new changes, not changes that you've already seen. We can ask the clipboard, was it a bitmap? No. Was it HTML? No. Was it plain text? Yes. So now we have a handle on this text data. It's this thing called a global a handle to a global piece of memory. This is another Windows, you know, historical anachronism. You'd have to call it. You just have to call a a little function to obtain the pointer to it. That's what this little global locker is. This little class I wrote. It calls global lock and the constructor, global unlock and the destructor, and gives you a little typed pointer to the data after it's locked. So we can obtain the uh, it's care star data that I've asked for because I asked for. If we go back here to where save text is called, I asked for type CF text, which is narrow string text, but there's also a Unicode text type that you could have asked for, in which case the data would come back as a WKRT, oops, a instead of a care star, but I'm using a narrow stream file here and just write out the text to the file and then close the file and go on. And if I go over to where my executable is, this is WinLAM build and clip snoop. Here's the file that got written, and it was the text that I had selected on the clipboard. I just wanted to show you that because um, to be able to compare it to the WTL version of this code, <coughs> the WTL version set up the same thing, but it was you know with the message maps and kind of the thing that's annoying about the message maps is that they're all macros and so it's hard to step through that in the debugger to, to you have to kind of I couldn't have this in line with the message map it would have to be the name of a method on this class and I would put a breakpoint in the class and if I wanted to step through the actual mechanism of the message dispatching because it's macros I wouldn't be able to do that and see what the code was actually what code was actually being executed because everything in WinLAM 
is all done with C++ inline functions on either global inline functions or function inline methods on classes. I can step through the whole event dispatching mechanism if I want to. Normally you don't need to, but if you're curious and want to see how that all works, you can step through it all. Um, and then it was just nice to see how this uh, code here looked, you know, using these com um, wrapper classes from WinLAM instead of the com wrapper classes from ATL. It was very, very similar. The only thing I had to do was just change the types of these smart pointers and the names of the methods I was calling to create a com object. And uh, otherwise, it was all the same. So that's uh, I kind of running long on time here because I spent a lot of time talking about little details of Windows programming, which I think is kind of important just to orient yourself into all this mess if you're if you've never been in here before. But uh, if you're going to do all of this straight from Visual Studio and not use CMake in my little pitch, I promised I would show you that and what it looks like looks very very similar so here's just this the same simple window example I just did it by I created a blank empty project in Visual Studio and the only difference is that in order to get WinLAM what I did was put my code in a git repository and then I had WinLAM as a git submodule otherwise it was all it's all the same uh, you can still use the resource editor obviously here you and, and instead of editing a CMake list dot text to add new files you just you know right clicks over here and say add you know new from template or new item you know add C++ source files header files resource files directly that way and when you're editing resources you just use the resource view and say add resource Otherwise, it's all the same because WinLAM being a header-only library, there's no like stuff you have to link to. It, uh, it will show you briefly, going back to the other one. So it's always handy with header-only libraries in CMake to um, add an interface library and then put the necessary... Uh, interface requirements on that interface library target inside CMake and that way you can just link against WinLAM as a target link library in your in whatever executable that you're or li other library that you're adding in CMake and the compiled definitions will carry over and the include directory search paths will carry over so I mentioned before, WinLAM does everything with wide strings, so we explicitly put the Unicode compiled definition on there, so any clients of our little CMake WinLAM target will automatically get Unicode defined for all their source code that's compiled, so you won't accidentally get the narrow character uh, API and get confused why things are you know not linking at link time. Okay, so that was probably way more than you ever wanted to know about Windows programming, but since WinLAM is a library for programming straight at the Win32 API level, that is the kind of stuff you need to know. There's a question here in the chat saying, I have a question regarding the Windows header, the one that contains exit, min, max, uh, title of program. I noticed that when some programs are full screen, it normally hides the, the Windows header. I think you're talking about the, the Windows decorations. Um, so when you want to take a Windows application and make it full screen and not have any decorations at all. So for instance, my uh, web browser here, you know, my web browser is full screen, um, but it's still got the title bar and, you know, the close button, those things are still there. And then in a lot of web browsers, you can press F11 to go even more full screen and now all that stuff's gone, right? The the close button isn't visible anymore. This, you know, it's got its own little thing that's appearing here. That's coming from the web browser itself. That's not coming from Windows, because it's the web browser has removed all the decorations. Uh, press F11 again to get back to the normal situation. And so the question is, how does that work? And the answer is that the 
if we go back to this code and we go to the first example there are these style bits in the uh, there's a style and an extended style bits and that is how you tell Windows what sort of or tell Win32 um, how or what decorations to put on the window so when you when the web browser when I press F11 and it switches to that full screen view and all the decorations have been removed what the web browser is doing is issuing a, a call into Windows to modify the style bits on the window to remove all of the decorations and it's repositioning and resizing its window to occupy the full screen so that's how that works and uh, it's also possible to get custom painting of those little bits of decoration Windows gives you the chance to say no I'm gonna paint those myself don't paint them for me and that's you might have seen some applications like really fancy title bars with like you know background images in the title bar or animations all kind of little doohickeys that's how they're doing that is there it's uh, Windows gives you a chance to paint what is called the non client area the area that encompasses all the little decorations and you get a chance to paint it if you want uh, or you can let Windows paint it for you which is the most common case uh, another question in the chat is um, the question is you know excited about WinLAM looks a lot like writing web interface with JavaScript it, it yeah the callback lambda nature um, has a similar kind of feel to it until you get down into the weeds of the the low-level Windows API and then it just it feels like C programming from the early 90s because it is uh, and the question is further if you were to relearn Win32 today would you learn by digging into the internals of abstraction like WinLAM or do you think it is still valuable to learn and create an application using the C APIs I would say using the raw C APIs is so much more labor that I would not recommend it now when I was uh, working on my little clipboard snooper thing here and converting it over I started writing a little my own little wrapper for the this, this uh, function of Windows called shell notify icon which I will show you what that looks like so the shell notify icon function this is a classic kind of Windows style function it takes a little code that says what it should do and a pointer to a structure that has all the extra data about what's supposed to happen this function is what you use to add your own little icon into this area the ta you know the Windows taskbar notification area so if you my intention for the clipboard snooper was to put an icon down in there so that I could click on it on the icon to get a context menu so I could say exit right because since I don't have a window how do I if I run this thing outside of the debugger how do I tell the program to stop and the answer is I wanted to put a little notification icon down in the notification area and then you would click on it and that would be a pop-up menu and I would tell it to exit um, I, I didn't get around to that either for the WTL example or for today's example but uh, what I did was exploring was you know trying to figure out how to use uh, make it like a winlam style wrapper because winlam didn't have one around shell notify icon put a winlam style wrapper around that so that I could use it in the same way that winlam wraps other features of Windows um, you can see they're all you know really simple inline functions so it's not hard to write one of these wrappers the, the difficulty is reading the details of the Windows API documentation and trying to understand exactly how this stuff works because the, again the API style is very like late 80s early 90s kind of C API style for manipulating a GUI object so it's more understanding you spend more time trying to figure out how things actually work from the way it's described in the documentation and experimenting than you do creating the wrapper once you once you understand how it works uh, you can create the, the wrapper pretty easily uh, another question in the chat is uh, can you explain more about separating GUI logic from application logic is a specific structure when creating a Windows application so in my little code that we looked at here with the mediator 
So the thing was that I separated the GUI. So this is all the dialogue class, right? This is all interacting directly with the GUI um, framework. In this case, it's Windows, but it could be any GUI framework. It could be Q interacting directly with Qt, interacting directly with Wix widgets, interacting directly with the thing that provides the concrete GUI classes. Okay, in this case, it's WinLAM, which is a thin wrapper around Win32. And all my business logic was moved over to the mediator. So this mediator code, it interacts with the GUI, but through an abstraction. And the abstraction is the key to being able to test this, because now that my business logic is connected to an abstraction, I can supply, in a unit test scenario, I can supply a mock abstraction and control what that abstraction does. So there's a, um, if you could look at those solid object-oriented design principles, S-O-L-I-D, uh, which one is it? It is, um, S is single responsibility principle, O is open coast principle, L is Liskov, uh, substitution, I think it's Liskov, which basically says details should depend on abstractions, ab details should not depend on other details. So by introducing this abstract dialogue between my mediator, which holds the business logic, and the concrete GUI class that implements the abstraction, having that abstraction in the middle is what enabled me to do the testing of my application logic. So it's not a specific structure. The mediator pattern is just a general pattern that's very suitable for doing this sort of testing. Um, but really, it comes down to that old thing in computer science is, you know, every problem is solved by an extra layer of indirection. If the stuff that I'm trying to test with a unit test is inside the middle of something else that's difficult to get at or difficult to instantiate, difficult to interact with because it's, you know, concrete GUI, it's not uh, an abstraction, the, the answer is put a, a layer of indirection in there, move it somewhere else that makes it easier to test. And that's what I did with this mediator. Um, when I put this code up on GitHub, I think it'll be uh, instructive for you to kind of poke around the code and see how it's connected. But the mediator pattern is just, you know, put a guy in the middle that mediates between the business logic and the concrete GUI. And now the business logic is interacting with abstract GUI, and I can mock that abstract GUI in a unit test, and I don't need to worry about a concrete GUI. Uh, one part, one more uh, question in the chat here is, what part of Win32 is, is it at its strongest? Um, not sure I understand that. Um, I mean, what is the strength of Win32? I mean, it's just, you know, the, the massive footprint of Windows and the installed base. I mean, realistically, why would you write a, maybe this is the question, why would you write a program directly to Win32 at this point in time, as opposed to using a GUI abstraction layer like Wix widgets or Qt? The answer is, uh, if you're doing something that those GUI abstraction toolkits don't expose like I don't think they expose the ability to make your own little system tray icon doohickey that you know sits in the system tray notification area of the taskbar or if they do in the case of QT QT is like MFC if you writing a small QT program results in a large executable right Wix widgets is a thinner wrapper but not every GUI abstraction our, our GUI framework that's targeted by Wix widgets exposes the idea of like the system tray notification area that, you know, I, I don't know, they might have that, uh, some kind of equivalent in like GNOME or some kind of one of those other Linux desktop frameworks. Uh, and then, you know, Wix widgets might have a way, a wrapper that exposes the equivalent functionality in both frameworks. Um, but for these little things, that hang around on your system tray, for instance, and they don't, like my little clipboard snooper, it's not doing much, right? I mean, the, the program's not very big, either in source code size or in executable size. And because we want that thing to be responsive, I mean, it's gonna get woken up every time something happens to the clipboard. Now, if it's a big, fat executable, it's not gonna be very cache-friendly, 
right? It's going to be, uh, especially if, if you've got a, a framework that's causing you to jump into a bunch of different portions of your executable because of the, you know, the way QT is implemented or what have you. MFC is similar. Um, so it can, you know, you paste something onto the clipboard and then suddenly because that, that little program was uh, out, swapped out, it hadn't, you hadn't used your clipboard in a while, it got swapped out of memory, so then you, you paste and then suddenly your machine kind of gets unresponsive because Windows is trying to send a notification to this program that's been swapped out onto disk, so it has to swap it back into memory, it has to execute it, and then and if the execution of the code is not cache coherent, it's going to cause even more cache misses and even more paging off of the, off of the disk and back into main memory. Now, we live in an, an, a world where, you know, there's, you know, 32 gigabytes of system RAM isn't unreasonable and things like that. But Windows has a tendency to take stuff that you haven't used and swap it out to disk. Now, you might say, I never notice it because I have an SSD. Well, it's even if with an SSD, it still is a lot of extra code that's executing in the operating system to swap that little program back in. So the smaller it is, uh, the 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 better for certain kinds of utilities. A little clipboard snooper is a good example. A small com object that is dynamically loaded into another application is another example. So those are some examples where it can be useful to use a programming style that's targeting the lowest layer of Windows that is exposed, which is Win32, instead of using a heavy framework like QT or MFC. Uh, even Wix widgets might be bringing in too much more than you wanted. Um, those things also have a deployment dependency. They have DLLs that you may have to, you know, if you're not linking against it statically, you may have to deploy extra DLLs with your application. Whereas uh, this clipboard snooper that I've written, the only thing it depends on are the DLLs that ship with Windows itself. So you drop that executable in and boom, it's ready to go. It's ready, ready to run. It doesn't need any other files to be installed. That also means it, it can be distributed as just a zip file. It doesn't need an installer, right? Installing it means unzipping and uninstalling it means deleting the executable. There's no additional stuff that needs to get packaged and configured into your system when you deploy these little small, lightweight, single purpose, uh, you know, kind of toolbox style applications. Um, now, for your, if you're, if you're writing, a, if your goal is just to write a Windows GUI desktop application, I probably wouldn't, even with WinLAM, I probably wouldn't recommend uh, coding at that level. I would recommend something like Wix widgets or QT or even MFC that provides a higher level abstraction and, I, you know, Q, probably MFC is probably a little long in the tooth now at this point. Uh, probably QT or Wix widgets is going to feel better. Uh, you know, less uh, stuff you have to keep researching to figure out how to do it because MFC is kind of still kind of macro-oriented programming from the 90s, even modern MFC. Um, there's also, you know, Windows has this new WinRT layer that allows you to specify UI using a XAML file, and that's decoupling the, the visual design from the application logic and so on. We've done a little bit of uh, discussion of WinRT in the past. There's a talk uh, I've done on WinRT on our YouTube channel. I didn't go much into the details of how to do GUI applications using that. We, we touch on it and show on it, show show how it works, but I didn't go into detail on it. But that's where Microsoft will push you these days if you are making a Windows only GUI application is they would steer you in the direction of XAML even if you were going to do your business logic in C++ for whatever reason. Uh, but if you're going cross-platform QT or Wix widgets seems to be uh, more popular in terms of making a GUI application from scratch. I think WinLAM you use when you know you're going to need you know you're going to be Windows only you know you're going to need to access some of these lower level facilities because of the nature of what it is you're doing. So you might as well just do the whole thing and it doesn't have a huge, might as well do the whole thing using WinLAM. And it doesn't have a huge GUI surface area. So you're, even though WinLAM makes it easier, uh, 
there's still lots of the little weird idiosyncrasies of the Windows messages, the notification codes and the message codes and lots of little stuff you need to know. Uh, Winlamp definitely makes it easier, but still, there's, there's a lot of irregularities in the way things are at that level in Windows because of its historical evolution over time. And you're just going to bump into them. And, you know, so that that's why the higher level abstractions are more popular, even if they have executable uh, and size costs, you know. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat. You can also ask questions by audio. But otherwise, I think we've kind of beaten this one to death for two hours. So we're, we're going to end. Okay, if there's nothing else, we will end it there. Thanks.